we're teaching language these days, we often position language as a tool for communication, which it very legitimately is. And this is a really positive shift from previous generations where language was seen as an academic subject. So you learned it and you got it great and then you promptly forgot it. So the focus on language as a communication tool is a good thing. But with our advanced students, we, we want to make sure they understand that language is much more than just a communication tool. We want them to understand the power of language. So that's what we're going to take a look at in this session. We're going to look at how language is a tool for persuasion and a tool for getting things done. And once we understand this as teachers, we can then unlock this for our students. We'll start the session with a brief discussion on the power of language. And we'll look at the different spheres in society where this power really manifests itself on a daily basis. Then we'll take a look at the different language tools that we have available to us as language users to be powerful with our language use. So we'll take a look at vocabulary tools, grammar tools, discourse tools, and paralinguistic tools. Then we'll wrap up with a brief discussion on the power of not saying something. So let's get started. We all know that language is a communication tool. So I have an idea that I want to share with you, so I use language to do so. And then you use language to interpret or understand my idea, and you also use language to tell me your corresponding idea. So we share information, we share ideas with language as our communication tool. But language is much more than this. Language can also be used for persuasion. So if I have an idea and I want to persuade you that this is the best idea in the world and that you have to take action on it, I'm also going to use language. So there's a lot of power built into very skilled language use. I can convince you to do things, persuade you to do things, persuade you to change your mind, and so on. And it is this use of language to persuade um, that we really want to share with our advanced level students so that they can understand that language is much more than a communication tool. It has a lot of power behind it, and good language use can actually give you a lot of power in your daily life and also in your professional life. We see the use of language for persuasion and for power purposes in all aspects of our society today, but there are four that really stand out as classic examples of how we can use language for persuasion and therefore um, for power purposes. And when I, I'll just clarify, when I use the word power, I don't mean, oh, I want to be a dictator or whatever, but power is, I'm using power simply to say, um, it gives me um, control over what I want to do. It helps me accomplish what I want to accomplish. So I'm not using power in a negative sense here. So we see language used for persuasion and, and power purposes um, in politics. That's probably the most obvious one. Okay? Politicians um, have speech writers to craft uh, very uh, powerful, I'm going to use the word power here a lot, uh, very powerful statements to convince people to vote for them or to support their actions. They also have um, people writing media releases and things like that and very much controlling their public image through the use of language. We also see um, the use of language for persuasion purposes in the media. So both in the news media and in the entertainment media, language is a very powerful tool. So I'm going to use certain words to tell you about news events to convince you, uh, very subtly possibly, to take a particular viewpoint on those news events. And I'll use language in another way to um, engage you and, and keep you entertained through my entertainment media. And then finally, we also see the power of language use and the power of persuasion um, through language use in advertising and marketing. So companies will spend literally millions and millions of dollars to get the right wording in an advertisement or to, to give the right message associated with a particular product. So these are four areas of society and daily life where we really see language used for persuasion purposes and power purposes. It's, these are obviously not the only ones, but these are the ones that give us the clearest examples of just how powerful language can be. When we want to use language for persuasion purposes or for power purposes, there are two strategies we can use. The first strategy is to very carefully decide what we are going to say. And the other strategy is the opposite. We very carefully decide what we're not going to say. So the very first thing that, that we as language users need to understand, and this obviously includes our students, is that there's power in what we say and there's also power and persuasion in what we don't say.
I've used the word persuasion a few times, and I just want to define this so that um, we're on the same page in terms of what this word means. So persuasion, or to persuade someone, is to do something or say something in order to get someone to either believe something or to do something. And we do this through the use of reason, through the use of understanding, and through the use of emotion. And so you can well imagine that language can be a very powerful tool for persuading someone to either do something or believe something. When we use language for persuasive purposes, we've got four sets of tools or language tools that we can tap into. We've got vocabulary tools, we've got grammar tools, we've got discourse pattern or discourse tools, and then we've got paralinguistic tools. And some of these paralinguistic tools are also pronunciation tools, and I'll explain that uh, when we get to that category. So let's take a look at each of these four language tool categories in turn and see what types of persuasive tools we've got at our disposal as language users. As a language teacher, you should be familiar with the terms literal and figurative language use. Literal language use means I'm using words exactly as they were intended to mean. So you could take the meaning from the dictionary and that's exactly how I'm using those words. Figurative language, on the other hand, means I'm giving subtle, between-the-lines meanings to otherwise ordinary words. And you might not find these meanings in a dictionary. Figurative language is really where the power of language use lies in terms of our vocabulary and our word choice. So we can be very persuasive with clever use of figurative language. We've got four main categories of figurative language that we can use for persuasion purposes. We've got metaphor, simile, euphemism, and dis-euphemism. So let's take a look at each of these four categories in turn. A metaphor is when the name of one thing is used to represent something else. And we, we make our choices in terms of what we're using to represent something else based on some possible shared characteristics. They're not identical, but they've got a core um, characteristic that, that's the same and that our, our listener or our reader can really um, subtly understand. So I'll, I'll use a few political examples. We've had some um, fun recently with the mayor here in Toronto. Um, so we could say Rob Ford is a train wreck. And so what they have in common is that um, they're a bit of a disaster. Um, so my metaphor is that I'm using train wreck to describe or to tap into this disaster likeness of the mayor of Toronto. Um, I can use another metaphor here. Rob Ford likes to stir the fire with the media. So he likes to get the media very emotional and get them reacting to things he says and does, um, and he's doing this very deliberately. So here I'm comparing the action of stirring a fire, which makes the fire burn brighter, to what Rob Ford does with the media. So these are two examples of metaphor. The power and persuasion with metaphor really comes from its visual appeal or the visual image that it creates in the listener's mind or the reader's mind. So if I were just to say Rob Ford is a disaster, it's like, yeah, so what, we all know that. But if I say Rob Ford is a train wreck, that conjures up in your mind this image of a very dramatic event and a very uh, traumatic event. And, you know, maybe there's fire, there's lots of noise, um, and it's just a really big, big event now in your mind. Um, so this really is the power of metaphor. It creates these wonderful uh, visual images in the listener's mind or the reader's mind, and it also creates an emotional reaction. A simile is another figurative language tool, and it's similar to a metaphor, but it's a bit more direct. So in a simile, I use the word like, or I use as, something as, to directly compare one thing to another. So using our political example here again, I can say, Rob Ford is like an Energizer bunny. He never knows when to stop. So I'm directly saying, okay, Rob Ford is, is, has all of these similar characteristics to an energizer bunny, and the main characteristic I want to focus on is that he just doesn't stop. So a simile, once again, conjures up in the listener's mind or the reader's mind a, a powerful visual image and some emotional reaction, but it does it a little bit more directly than a metaphor by directly linking the two pieces with the words like or as something as. The next vocabulary tool for persuasion is a euphemism. A euphemism is a word that we substitute for a word that might be taboo or too direct or that might make people feel too distressed or too uncomfortable. So here are some classic examples. So instead of saying that someone dies, which some people might react to um, and feel uncomfortable to, we say to pass away. It has a softer feel to it. In, uh, in war, instead of saying to kill someone, so we killed the enemy, 
we can say we terminated the enemy, so there's more distance there, and so we're more comfortable with it. Or we can say we eliminated the enemy, or we eliminated the threat. So euphemisms allow us to kind of cushion or soften the harshness of what we would otherwise say. A dis-euphemism is the opposite of a euphemism. So instead of trying to cushion things and make things seem a little softer and a little less harsh and maybe less distressing, we're going for the opposite effect. We want something to sound harsher and to be more distressing. So here are some examples. So we, in, we might call something an act of terror or an act of war in order to get a really strong reaction from people. So these are classic examples of dis-euphemisms. Euphemisms and dis-euphemisms are classic tools of politicians in their speech writing. So if you have a chance, listen to a politician speak and you'll hear how this politician uses euphemisms to either soften what they're saying or be a little less direct or dis-euphemisms to actually make it sound harsher and stronger. So the classic place to find euphemisms at work and dis-euphemisms at work is in our political speak. We've also got grammar tools available to us in order to be persuasive with our language choices and therefore be more powerful in our language use. So some of the grammar tool examples that we'll take a look at include inclusive pronouns, modals, adverbs and adjectives of degree, fronting and inversion, and parallelism. Inclusion pronouns allow the speaker to indicate to the listeners that he or she is part of the group. So it's not just me here on my own as a speaker, but it's all of us. We're all in this together. So instead of saying I, I'm going to say we. So I don't say I believe or I feel. I will say we believe and we feel. And so I'm automatically assuming that we're all in the same situation together and we're all on the same team. Modals allow a speaker to indicate degrees of uncertainty, degrees of necessity, and degrees of urgency. So a really good speaker who knows how to use language persuasively will strategically select modals that give that type of message or the message they're going after. So for example, if I don't want to sound really strong, I could say, oh, we might want to do something. But if I want to sound really strong and powerful and convincing, I would say we have to do something or we need to. So I'm strategically choosing which one, I, which one I'm using depending upon the degree of uncertainty or the degree of urgency that I want to put out there. So modals are a really good tool for using language powerfully. We've also got adverbs and adjectives of degree at our disposal in order to be persuasive. So I can say absolutely, completely, entirely, urgently to add some degree of emotional urgency to what I'm saying or persuasiveness to what I'm saying where I can say absolute, complete, entire, and so on. So I can strategically choose to use my adverbs or adjectives of degree in order to be persuasive. Fronting and inversion are an interesting grammatical tool that we can use to be persuasive. Fronting means taking a clause that normally appears at the end of a sentence after the verb and taking it all the way before the subject in the sentence. So normally I might say something like this. The great, some of the greatest minds the world has ever seen lived in this century. So that's how I would normally say the sentence. But if I want to front it, I'm going to say, in this century lived some of the greatest minds the world has ever seen. In inversion, I'm actually changing the order of the subject and verb. So in English, normally we go subject and then verb. With inversion, I'm flipping it around and my verb or my auxiliary verb actually comes before the subject. So here's an example. Normally we might say, her daughter was not allowed to stay out late under any circumstances. In inversion, I'm gonna flip it around and I'm gonna say, under no circumstances was her daughter allowed to stay out late. So I flipped my subject and my verb. And last but not least, we have parallelism. Parallelism is actually a, a grammatical rule in English, and parallelism simply means that when we're listing items, we want to use the same structure for each of the items in the list. So if I'm listing things and I start with a verb, all of the other items in the list will be verbs. Or if I start with a noun, they'll also be nouns. But I can use parallelism in order to be persuasive by actually repeating a structure over and over again when I'm listing them. So for example, if I want to convince you to vote for me, I could say, you should vote for me because I am hardworking, I am honest, and I have a lot of integrity. So I have repeated I am, I am, I am, 
in, in order to reinforce the message, you know what, I'm all these really good things and you should vote for me. So parallelism, while it's just a standard grammatical rule, can be used strategically to be persuasive. We've also got discourse tools that we can use in order to be persuasive. So we'll take a look at four of these. We'll take a look at, first of all, the rule of three, not following discourse patterns, sound bites, and storytelling. The rule of three simply means that when you want to make a point, you should use three examples to illustrate that point. Not one, not two, but three. And that kind of hammers home the message. So for example, the mayor comes to work drunk, he continues to drink at work, and he goes home drunk. So three times with three different examples, I have reinforced the fact that the mayor drinks too much, or I think the mayor drinks too much. So that's the rule of three. The next discourse tool we have available to us in order to be persuasive or to get power in a conversation or situation is an interesting one. This one is where we don't follow or we strategically choose not to follow an agreed upon discourse pattern. So a discourse pattern is simply when two speakers or anyone involved in conversation, they agree to say, take turns saying different things and they follow an agreed upon pattern. And it's just an intuitive pattern to native speakers and non-native speakers have to learn this. So for example, if we're doing introductions, I'll say, hi, my name is, and you'll say, oh, hi, nice to meet you, my name is, and then maybe I'll ask, where are you from? And you'll tell me and you'll ask, where am I from? And so we kind of follow this pattern um, that everyone who's doing introductions follows. In order to be persuasive or to, to kind of get more power to ourselves, we can actually break the discourse pattern very deliberately and that leaves the other person confused and sort of powerless and floundering. So there's someone who's actually really good at doing this and that's Russell Brand. I know he's known as a comedian, but he's actually very clever with his communication in interviews because he chooses strategically not to follow the discourse pattern. So in an, in an interview, normally the interviewer asks a question and then the person being interviewed answers and back and forth like that. What Russell Brand does is the interviewer asks a question and Russell Brand might answer a different question or might ask a question back without answering the first question. And this very subtly and very cleverly shifts the power over to the person who's breaking the discourse pattern. So if you want to see this in action, just uh, Google Russell Brand an interview and pull up any of his media interviews and you'll see this in action. It's very clever and the person who's on the receiving end of this discourse pattern breaking really has no idea what's going on and also doesn't know how to handle it. If you've ever had any kind of media training, you'll be aware of another strategy um, that is all about breaking discourse patterns. And that is the strategy of staying on message. So if a politician is being interviewed or anyone who's in, in the media glare is being interviewed, he or she will have an idea in his or her head about what they want the media to pick up on. So what they want the media or the message to be. And no matter what the people in the media ask, the person doing the answering always gives the same message. So this is called staying on message. So if I'm staying on message, no matter what question you ask me or what topic you try and shift things to, I'm always going to respond with my message. And I might use different words or different examples, but I'm always giving the same message over and over again, no matter what question you ask me. This is a really good strategy and you'll see politicians use this all the time. So if you want to see it in action, take a look at any political interview and you'll see the politician staying on message. Another discourse tool that you'll see people in the media using all the time in order to be persuasive and to, to kind of keep power them, to themselves is sound bites. So a sound bite is simply a very short, clear and concise phrase or statement that very clearly communicates the message that the person wants to put out there. And politicians, for example, will deliberately embed sound bites in their speeches. And those are the clips or the pieces that the media picks up on. And these are the clips that you'll see on the news. And the clips are no more than 30 seconds long. And they, they're just very deliberately put out there to communicate a particular message. So very clever politicians will embed sound bites into what they're saying when they're um, talking to the media. If someone is a little bit emotional or not in control of an interview, um, they might accidentally let something out that then becomes a soundbite. And this is a case of not controlling your soundbites. So if I have an emotional reaction to something you say, 
um, that might be the clip that gets shown on the news. And that's the situation of me not controlling my sound bites. But if I'm very strategic, I will control those sound bites and then the message that I want to get out there in the media gets out there. A final discourse tool to make sure our students are aware of is storytelling. Stories are really powerful ways to communicate a message or communicate an idea. And it, stories allow a speaker to kind of personalize things and make themselves, uh, make others able to relate to them and understand where they're coming from and believe in them. So storytelling is a really good skill that we want our students to have. We also have paralinguistic tools available to us in order to be persuasive. Paralinguistic tools are things we can do when we deliver our communication that are actually not about our word choices or our grammar or vocabulary or anything like that. They're kind of about our delivery style. So um, some key paralinguistic tools that we can use in order to be persuasive are volume, speed, fluency, and nonverbal communication. So I can use volume in order to get your attention. And it's not so much about speaking loudly to get attention, but actually doing a shift in volume. So I can shift my volume up and get your attention. And I can also shift my volume down and get your attention. So if, I wanna, if I'm just talking at a normal volume and then I want you to pay attention to something, I'm going to take my volume high. So I'm going to speak louder. And then I'm going to go back to my normal volume. And then I might take my volume low. I might go down to a whisper and then take it back up. And so it's the variation in volume that really gets attention and allows me to use my language powerfully. Speed is used similarly to volume. So I'm gonna speak at a normal speed, but then I can get your attention by either slowing down or speeding up. And so it's that variation in speed that makes you pay attention and makes you really listen to what I'm saying. Fluency is an interesting one. I can give you different messages by being either very fluent, so my communication comes out very smoothly, or I can give you a different message by sort of hesitating and, and trying to find my words. Okay? So when I'm speaking with fluency, I can give off the image of being very confident and just being um, very good with what I'm trying to say. But if I start hesitating, then maybe I don't sound quite as confident but I might deliberately choose to do that. So if I think I'm coming across too strongly, I might hesitate a little bit so that you don't think I'm overconfident or arrogant and so on. So I can use my fluency very strategically um, to say I'm very confident or to introduce a little lack of confidence so that you don't think I'm arrogant or overbearing. Nonverbal communication also allows me to be persuasive when I'm communicating. So I can use different facial expressions, I can use different gestures. You'll notice I use my hands a lot. I try not to, but I do. Um, so I can use my gestures. I can use posture so I can stand very straight or I can stand kind of in a relaxed way. I can use head movement so I can do no, yes, in order to be persuasive. And finally, I can use eye contact. Okay, If I'm making eye contact that says, hey, I'm confident you should listen to me and I am being persuasive. So we've got a lot of tools in terms of nonverbal communication to paralinguistically be persuasive. We've covered a lot of different tools that we have available to us and that we want to teach our students that we can use when we're communicating in order to be persuasive and to use language powerfully. So we've looked at vocabulary tools, grammar tools, discourse tools, and paralinguistic tools. If you want to see these tools in actions and many of these tools at the same time in action, just take a look at any politician delivering a speech. So there are politicians today and also from, you know, back in history who were very, very powerful and very persuasive as speakers. So if you listen to them and watch them in action, you'll see all of these different tools being used. So take a look at Barack Obama or Bill Clinton or John F. Kennedy, Winston Churchill. These politicians were all really, really good speakers and very persuasive and powerful speakers. So take a look at them in action and you'll see these different tools being used. So far we've looked at what we can say and how we can say it in order to be persuasive and powerful with our language use. There's another strategy we can take, however, and that is we can find the power and the persuasion in what we don't say. 
And there's two main strategies here that we can use. One is presupposition and the other is implicature. Presupposition is a strategy I'll take when there's an assumption behind what I'm saying and I'm counting on you to know that assumption. So for example, if I say I am no longer the manager, the assumption is that at some point before this point in time, I was the manager. But I'm not saying that I was the manager and now I'm not. I'm simply saying I am no longer the manager. So there's an assumption that I'm counting on you to tap into to understand what I'm saying. And implicature is, is fairly similar, but there's a bit of a twist here. Implicature means I'm saying something and I'm counting on you to imply the rest. So I'm just saying a little piece of it, but I'm counting on you to figure out the rest of what's going on. So going back to, I said, okay, I'm no longer the manager. And then I say, I did not resign. So the implication is that I was fired. But I'm not going to say that. I'm only going to give you the beginning part. And I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out the rest of it. So I did not resign. I'm counting on you to figure out that I was fired. Presupposition and implicature are all about getting our listener or our reader to read between the lines. Reading between the lines simply means we want someone to figure out what I'm not saying because actually what I'm not saying is more important than what I actually am saying. So this is another strategy we have in order to be persuasive and powerful. I don't say the most important thing and I count on you to figure out what that is. When our students get to an advanced level of proficiency, we want to take them beyond language as a communication tool or language for sharing ideas or getting information or giving information. We want them to really understand just how beautiful and how powerful language is. In order to do this, we want to take them through these vocabulary, grammar, discourse, and power linguistic tools so that they can really understand just what they can do with language when they learn to use language well. And don't forget, we also want to take them through this whole idea of reading between the lines, that what they don't say is just as important as what they do say. So have some fun and try teaching your advanced level students some of these tools so that they can tap into the wonderful power of the language that they're learning.